This I remember. Mother always said, sing child, sing. Make a song and sing. Beat out your own rhythms, the rhythms of your life. But make that soul soulful and make life sing. Sing, daughter, sing. Around you are uncountable tunes. Some sung, others unsung. Sing them to your rhythms. Observe, listen, absorb, soak yourself, bathe in the streams of life, and then sing, sing simple songs for all to hear and learn and sing with you. Having started with the words of my elder sister, teacher, and mentor, Mishere Gidai Mugo, in her poem, Daughter of My People Sing, I must thank my other elder sister and mentor, Marema Tore, and my brother, Marshall Belzelinga, for the privilege of being in community with all gathered around in this important initiative. And I want to thank our moderator, for beautifully capturing our appreciation to everyone else. So I'm not going to go into all the other thank yous. And the Brimma, who I'm just going to keep piggybacking on the presentation he's just given, has made it very easy for me. I was invited to speak to three things, performances, values, humanities. And I'm going to attempt to do so in 15 minutes that I have, but because I must warn you, I'm a storyteller. That's why I'm timing myself. Because when we start sharing stories, we can get into a space where the story becomes so sweet that I forget to emphasize the things that I hope is manifest in them. So let me start by sharing the three invitations that I hope this presentation gives to the community of intellectuals working on African humanities. And I must credit my brother, Godwin Murunga, for teaching me to put my lessons first in case I run out of time. The first. It's an invitation to expand to a multiplicity of ways of knowing, to celebrate and celebrate the plurality of performances through which we, as Africans, make meaning of the worlds in which we live. The second, an invitation to conceptualize and articulate a system of values that honors, makes manifest, and amplifies not just the plurality of performances, but also the pluriversality of who we are and the approaches that we bring to intellectual work. And the third, to make manifest and amplify the fullness and implications of what it means to be both African and human in every sense and through time, linking the past and the future through the present that we live in. So let me begin with the first set of words. And I'm making them a set because I'm going to be talking of moving from the singular to the plural in each case. So from performance to performances. Two words come to mind. Performance, I am a performance scholar, and we define performance as to make meaning. To perform is to make meaning, it is to know. And we talk about knowing as both in terms of the verb, the process of knowing, of getting to know, getting to understand, and the product, the noun, that comes out of this process. Therefore, performances as knowing, as meaning making, is not only about what people know, but also about who knows what, how do they know it, why do they know it in the way that they know it, and what else they don't know, and why they don't know that. In my mind, this is all linked to a second word, oracha. Because when I first went to the Department of Performance Studies and everybody kept talking about this as a new discipline, it's amazing, it's exciting, it's a different way of looking at the world, I kept thinking about the word oracha, as defined by Pio Zirimu and Austin Bukenya at Festac 77, where they argued that we need to pay as much attention to teaching 
and teaching in oracy as we do to literacy in the sense of the written. Not as an either or, not as a people in the past used to, or cultures that did not write used to, and now that we have learned to write, because that implies a deficiency. And I remember one of my um, professors, um, Gashanja Wakiai, telling me that the reason he did not take up oratia or oral literature when it first began being taught at the University of Nairobi is that the lecturer who introduced them to it defined it as what we Africans used to use before we learned how to write. But rather, we need to think about in what contexts would it make sense to have and use the mastery in oral and other embodied performance skills, and in which ones do we need to use written and other inscribed skills, and how do we teach and work with not one instead of the other, but both one and the other. Zirimu and Bukenya sought to restore a sense of balance. And I want to acknowledge a whole range of others who have contributed to my understanding of Oricha, from Michelle Mugo, whom I started with, cited in, um, earlier on, and others whom I cannot speak to, Pierce Ntuli, Kwesi Owusu, Kofi Anyidoho, Nina Mulope, Nkiru Nzwegu, and I could go on and on. In a way, we are talking about languages, just as we did this morning, listening to Suleiman Bashir Dian. And as he was speaking, I kept thinking about how much of what he said of verbal languages is true for those of us who need to use the full range of languages available to us. Languages that we not only speak, but hear, thinking of Kofi Anidoho who talks about oracha, but also languages that we see, that we feel. Here I'm thinking about Senghor telling us, je don't, donc je suis. We need to learn these languages and use them, and also learn how to translate from one medium to another. So I define oracha as the transcending of boundaries in the making of meaning. And here we're thinking of all kinds of boundaries, of genre, of intellectual disciplines, as Godwin Murunga talked to us, between all our senses, the auditory, olfactory, kinesthetic, visual, gustatory, and more, what the English call the sixth sense of perception, where you just know in your knower that you know, and then you have to figure out what it is that you know and how you know it. Into this liminal space where intellectuals working in different spaces, I have um, made a promise to myself, I will not publish if I, uh, on the page if I have not yet published on the stage. So I'm learning to work not only in the academy, but with artists, with activists, with policymakers, and bring it all together. Working between the past and the future with the present as a bridge. So the first set of questions, what do we know and how do we know it? What don't we know and why don't we know it? What might help us know better what we don't know? And who is working in ways and spaces that we can learn from that we ourselves are not working in? This invites us to explore the diversity of ways in which African people know the world. It demands that we study the range of available texts and of course here I'm thinking about text as a vessel for meaning. The many kinds of texts that we in the academy ignore unless they are objects of study, but that we must learn to use in our processes of work, in the ways we think, research, explore, every part of the process, whether it is identifying research questions, developing proposals to collecting data, analyzing it, articulating the findings, theorizing and reporting the findings, and finally, to publishing, for what is publishing, but simply amplifying the knowledge for others. Let me move to the second set of words, from value to values. What this means is that we must pay attention to what we value, why we value it, who has told us that it has value, and how do we decide to show that it has value to us? And this is about thinking about worth, of the weight we put on something, that which we, we cherish, treasure, 
and how we continue to make it manifest, not only to ourselves, but also to others. Who is centered in the questions that we ask? Whose priorities are we following? Whose agenda are we investing in? And I think this is at the core of the questions we were just asking when we thought and talked about African humanities or humanities in Africa. Because we can study Africa through many lenses, but we also know that the way we study and what we study can diminish the value, the weight, the worth of who we are and what we bring to the table, or it can make it manifest to everyone. And frequently, all sorts of agendas and priorities are at play when we come to the study of Africa. And I really thank Ebrima for making that so clear so I can just jump into a quick story. And this is a story I heard from Yvonne War, an intellectual who has chosen to work through story as a weaver of words. Yvonne is the one indeed who gave me the definition that story is the crafted creative representation of lived human experience. And Yvonne is currently writing a book on coffee. And she was giving a, um, a speech somewhere in New York. And she happened to comment and ask the question, why the scientific name for coffee is coffee arabica and not coffee africanus. Mm -hmm. And somebody responded to her and said, well, you know, Africans did not know what to do with coffee. It is others who taught them to value coffee. And so Yvonne gave him a history lesson on where coffee came from, and he countered by talking about the economics of coffee. South America is exporting more to the world than anywhere else. No African country is exporting as much as Brazil, for example. He talked about which country's coffee has the most monetary value and which country spends the most on coffee, including, and this is not in Africa, I think it was America. In response, Yvonne told him of two myths. One, I don't have time to perform it properly, is the story of a spirit that so desired to commune with human beings that it infused into itself, into a plant. It made that plant attractive to all human senses so that human beings would be drawn to it through its color. And then it gave human beings the heart to nurture it until it produced berries that developed into beans. It taught them to harvest the berries, to roast them, to grind them into powder, and to make coffee. It taught them to imbibe, to imbue it. It imbued the coffee so that the people could take it in through their sight, through touching it, through smelling it, through tasting it, and finally through taking the spirit into their own body. And you know you cannot drink coffee on your own. Even if you've just made yourself a cup of coffee, the smell will call other people and it will go into them as well. And when you look into the production of coffee in this culture, everyone is involved. From the men who grow and tend to the coffee, to the children who help harvest and sort out the beans, to the women who prepare us, make it ready for everyone to indulge in it. I ask, what is the value of coffee? Is it in dollar signs? Or is it in the sense of community that coffee brings? I don't have time to tell you of the other story, but I must mention it briefly because of what Aminata Traore said this morning so powerfully. It was about how God gave coffee to bring people together who were at war in order to make peace. For coffee is not something you can make in a hurry. Instant coffee is an abomination but it is designed to bring, make people slow down, and the rituals of coffee is to bring people to reason together. I want to end by talking about humanity and humanities, because humanity is poorer when it does not engage with knowing itself through the lived experiences, realities, and perspectives of the entire humanity, including us as Africans. And I'm going to end just very briefly. Ebrima has done the work for me, so I can come back and talk about this in, in, in the question, because I know my time is up. But let me end with one example. The dress I am wearing is not by accident. It is a performance 
that in one image speaks to many levels. And I wear this dress whenever I am going into spaces where I am intimidated by the sheer weight of the community, such as yours, that I am going to speak to. From a purely aesthetic point of value, you might think it is beautiful or ugly depending on your taste. Perhaps you don't like the color or the motifs or the design. Some of you might recognize it and say this is a leso or a kanga, and maybe even locate it in the terms of origin to the Swahili coast of Eastern Africa. But that's just a beginning, just a glimpse of what it is. For me, this dress is a text, a palimpsest of who I am as a human being with a specific identity marked by gender, generation, region, country, ancestry. It is history and geography, economics and political science, language and literature, mathematics and botany, all rolled up into one. It carries histories of different historical eras of globalization that remind me that people have lived and experienced realities far different from the ones we know today. That we as Africans contributed to those civilizations and histories and that we did more than survive. We thrived in those eras. It speaks to me of the mind-blowing ingenuity of women just like me, African women whose creativity and innovation in the face of change influence not just the design of the cloth as it comes to us today, but catalyzed technological change that had impact in economies as far as Mumbai in India and Salem, Massachusetts in Boston, USA. It reminds me of the spirit of once enslaved women who emancipated themselves and announced their liberation to, to the world through the designs and motifs they put on the cloth. And it reminds me of my sisters, mothers, and daughters all over the world who in this moment are wearing this cloth at work, be it at home, in the fields, in the market, in the office, at school. It speaks of the present, of the challenges of the present economic system anchored as it is by neoliberalism and global hierarchies of power that make our economy subservient to systems of values that are not those I spoke of alive. And it speaks to the future. It defies all those who have predicted its demise, finding new ways of being, new ways of value, new performances in our humanity, in the futures that we dream of. And I haven't yet even begun to talk about the personal elements of this particular kanga, who gave it to me and why, the meaning embedded in it when I say that it is my mother's song given to me. It is the designer who transformed this cloth and her story. I simply just do not have the time to make all the points that I make simply by walking through this space in this kanga. So let me finish by these two quotes. In the words of Nkiru Nzwegu, who in her ALA monthly lecture last week speaking to Ase Aesthetics, argues that human creative expressions fit in the grand scheme of life to expand human objectives by raising questions on how we create, what we create, and for what purposes. And then she asserts, these are not ideal questions. They are knowledge questions that demonstrate our awareness about the ripple effect character of life that are consistent with the foundational ontology of a people and that are in line with the articulation of nature, of being, and of existence. So borrowing the eloquence of the sages, let me end with the words of Aikwe Ama in his epistemic novel, Kempt. And I'm truly pleased that this session was preceded by that presentation by Yopereka Somet on, the, on La patron, Patronomie Egyptienne Ancienne. Let us work to turn the forgotten path into the remembered way. Let us mix the long memories of a people once forgotten into new narratives of our own making as we move into spaces of our own choosing, as we dream in images drawn from our people's best desires, as we plan in designs drawn from our own reflection, then make again the universe that might have been but was not here in this place, now, in this time, freed for our new creation. Together, 
I will walk with you away from the super highways of forgetfulness onto the paths of rememberingness. Together, we shall breathe new energy into the faded people, memories of a people once destroyed. Let us walk together, invoking the future into now. Thank you so much. This is excellent presentation. Thank you very much for your gender uh, approach and integration and future literacy as well. Thank you.